This is Amy. I'm the vice president of conservation at Oakland Zoo. And you're listening to Cocktails in Conservation. We're gathering together. And I'm just going to say what I always say. What a joy it is to share this world with wildlife. Seriously, especially during COVID. Um, and it's a challenge. But there is hope. And that's why we have these things. Um, we can do this together. We can, especially with leadership from our guests, like the one we have tonight, this evening. So welcome, welcome. We're at season two of Cocktails and Conservation. Cocktails and Conservation, where we rendezvous with inspiring wildlife conservation leaders from around the planet. Hear their stories, learn how they protect the animals we love, and how each of us can help them. With our featured custom cocktail, together we toast to Taking Action for Wildlife. All right. Yes, um, we're doing it again. So we got to do this 10 times last year. Um, we're going to do six lovely ones this year. We really wanted to try this again. Try them virtual, and who knows, maybe by our last one at the very end of the year, we'll get together live. Let's see how it goes. But welcome back. This is Cocktails in Conservation 2021, where we meet wildlife heroes from around the globe. We listen to their stories. We join in their solutions. We have a refreshing beverage with people like you, um, people like you who want to learn, take action, do something about it. Um, so it's such a nice way to get together, raise awareness, um, drink, support, and be together and have hope. So let's see who's here. I hope you can say hello. Where are you coming from? Like, where are you right now? And how did you find out about this? We are always curious. And if you're just ready to go on your drink, it's called Bird About Town, made from District in Oakland. And the recipe will be in the chat. So you can kind of get that mixed up as I chat. All right. Yay. We're so excited to have you. Woohoo. Happy to be here. Where are you? Um, yay. Well, you're here, but where are you physically? We want to know. Um, okay. So tonight, we usually, you know, we say that we're going to travel far and pretend and go to all these places, but we're just going to go here. Have you heard of this place? Um, we're going to stay local. We're going to stay right here in California. In fact, I'm not even going further than my workplace. We're just going to visit with Oakland Zoo Conservation that's happening because we just have a lot to say and we have an amazing guest. Her name is Dr. Herman. She's the Vice President of Veterinary Services at Oakland Zoo. She and her team of vets and vet techs and, and all the animal care staff Together, they really work miracles um, with some of our native species. They've done amazing things. Of course, they work with our regular zoo species from a tarantula to a grizzly, but they've also taken on um, some of our, our local work that needs to be done. And that's what we're gonna talk about tonight. It's a growing program. Alrighty, so let's throw out a question of the day for fun. Tonight, honestly, maybe yesterday marks one year since COVID started, at least for Oakland Zoo, when I came into work with my team and we were asked to just go home. Um, didn't know what to do. That was a year ago and we've come really far. So my question for you is what has kept you sane during this year? And I bet a lot of you are going to say nature. Um, but go ahead and write that in the chat. We want to know. We want to welcome you. Yay. It's so good to see you who are all popping on and watching. Um, Thank you to anyone here, YouTube or Facebook, Oakland Zoo Friends of the Wild, staff and volunteers, friends of district in Oakland, um, anyone in our conservation community, anyone who just likes cocktails, who happens to see this, doesn't know why they even landed here, you are welcome. You're supposed to be here. Um, and animal lovers of all kinds, um, we're glad we're here. So um, I've talked a little bit about who our guest is, and um, we're just so excited to have her. I can only say that um, I know she's had 25 years of experience doing this kind of work in other settings. She's always helped at the Oakland Zoo. She's kind of had this magical presence. And when we got to hire Dr. Herman as a full-time staff, there was rejoicing. Like every department in the zoo was just so excited to have her. Now I understand the reasons why, and you're going to too. So here she comes.
Welcome, Dr. Herman. Let's unmute you for more info. <laughs> Good evening. Nice to see you guys. Yay. Um, we're so glad to have you here. It's so good to just have someone who's my most closest local hero um, be our speaker and um, buddy tonight. Um, so this is our casual chat part of the um, part of the segment. Um, so why don't you just tell us where you are right now? Well, I'm at the Oakland Zoo Veterinary Hospital. I'm in the large animal treatment area. This is kind of the heart of where we work. So uh, we had a very sick goat this week, Annie from the Children's Zoo. So in this room, we were able to put in an IV catheter to hydrate her, give her pain medication, um, give her a lot of vitamin B, ruminate ruminants need that when they're sick, um, and put in an IV catheter so we could give uh, intravenous hydration. Uh, we took her right next door into our radiology suite to x-ray her chest, x-ray her belly, uh, take blood, run the blood in our lab here at the hospital, just see what's going on. So uh, we do a lot in this hospital and we do a lot in this room. So yeah. Okay. Wow. Um, and it's LED, like lead certified and all kinds of fancy environmental things too. Very proud. Yeah. Um, and what, so during this whole year, was your job different? Um, how was your COVID year there? When COVID initially hit, um, I split our team. Uh, so half the nurses, half the doctors on one team, and then you know two separate teams that didn't overlap. Um, so our team is really great communicators and everybody practices really good medicine. So we could do that, but it did mean a lot of the times we had half the people on. Uh, so it's definitely a lot of work for everybody, but I think everybody, you know, we're all here to help the beautiful animals. And so we were able to just really work hard and communicate well and get through it. Our team has been blended back together again since August. Uh, but we come to work every day and we have really hands-on jobs. So really nothing remote about practicing zoo veterinary medicine. Got it. Yeah. Um, and then personal question, everyone's answering it, which is really sweet. I like being a docent kept me sane. Um, but what kept you sane during the year? Well, I think just remembering that the animals need us so much. Um, they're so incredible and kind of teach us the truth every day and just focusing on them and, and just feeling so honored that we could care for them. Um, so I would say that professionally. And then personally, I would say my garden had some good improvements done to it. I was out there a lot in my garden. Um, and then I like to go running and spend time with my husband and my son. So I would say those would be the things that make sense. Even feel. <laughs> that makes sense. Um, okay, a couple quick announcements before we dig in too much further. Um, if you would like to watch old conservation um, cocktails and conservation shows, you can at the link we're going to show you. And you can also see the upcoming schedule. Um, after this one, next month, we're going to hear about grizzlies in uh, Montana. And then the rest of the season, we're going to really focus in on the illegal wildlife trade. One of our big focuses this year at Oakland Zoo, learn about pangolins, chimps, elephants, moon bears, and animals really affected, and of course heroes doing something about it. So we're excited for this whole season, um, but let's go back to our issue of the day, which is here at home. So California um, has issues. We got wildfires um, caused by climate issues. We have human wildlife conflict. We have car strikes, um, rodenticide, we have a lot um, of, of things to face. And I, I really get that like a really well-equipped zoo with staff like you um, could, could really make a difference if it's in their heart to do so. So um, we're just so excited to learn all about that and, and find out why the Oakland Zoo decided to do that. But before we ask that, we just wanna know more about you. So I'm going to share this adorable picture of you. <laughs> Um, I think you're at Oakland Zoo there. I'm at Oakland Zoo. Yeah. So we love to ask, I mean, you have such an unusual job. Like what was the moment growing up that made you know that you're going to be a vet working with tarantulas, grizzlies, mountain lions, flamingos? Like how did you get there? 
Well, I always knew I was going to be a veterinarian. I can remember being very short and knowing that I would be a veterinarian. <laughs> um, and I grew up in a household, both my parents are biologists. Um, like my dad's body of work is the hormonal cascade that makes um, monarch butterflies do their migratory behavior. So I had a pet tarantula, of course, and a squirrel that I nursed back to health and a pet octopus, limulus crab, a lot of invertebrates um, that my dad worked with as a zoologist. So I always knew I wanted to be a veterinarian, but I always knew it would not just be for dogs and cats. Wow. Um, and then what was your path to the position? Well, uh, being a good student and really loving science, you know, I grew up in a super science household where you know, we would chase butterflies all weekend with our dad out in the fields and go to monarch butterfly trees and feed the different animals and clean glassware in his lab and stuff like that. So I was always um, just very interested in science. And uh, I think a lot of people in my family are kind of citizen scientists and then other medical practitioners too. So kind of grew up in that milieu and it was just always so fascinating and interesting. And I still feel that way. You know, I learn cool new stuff every day. So just always interest in kind of immersion. Um, and then when I went to school, I do like art a lot. So I got an undergraduate degree wow. major in drawing and biology. Um, and then I went to vet school at UC Davis uh, and graduated in 1997. So that's my education. <coughs> that's awesome. All right. So Dr. Herman, wow. Like I'm just going to show a random photo I have, but just tell us, pick any day in the life of your job and tell us what goes down. All right. Just with the exotic animals. And here you are helping a, what is happening in this photo? So right there, um, I'm neutering a grizzly bear. Uh, we have four male grizzly bears here at the Open Zoo, and uh, they all need to live together in a congenial fashion. So as we see with dogs in the dog park or male bears that all have to live together, um, being neutered is going to make them more amicable. The other thing, too, is we do, as an AZA accredited institution, participate in the species survival plan. So we really pay attention and follow the rules for what animals should be allowed to breed and not to maintain genetic uh, diversity and captivity. Mm -hmm. um, so these guys weren't slated to reproduce. Um, so we neutered all four of them in a couple of weeks. So it, it really, as you can see from the picture, kind of takes a three ring circus to do these big procedures. Mm -hmm. um, we anesthetized our beautiful, one of our lion boys, Gandia, a couple of weeks ago for some gastric upset just the medicines we were giving him for intestinal upset weren't working. Um, and we wanted to get a lot of information about what was going on and make a diagnosis for him. And I think probably the total people between the specialists that came in to help us and all of the animal care, you know, we have to remember like we take the x-rays, we take the blood, we interpret the blood results, but that lion is trained to get a hand injection um, with our keepers, um, making them voluntarily comply in their care. And that makes so much less stress um, and really helps the veterinary hospital do our job. But it also, you know, when you see zookeepers out in the zoo, they're not just feeding and cleaning up after the animals, they're training them to participate in their own care. And that really helps our job a lot. Uh, you know, we can walk in, give an injection and the lion falls asleep. Um, as opposed to, you know, stressful darting or something like that, which we'll do if we have to, but it's nice to avoid. Uh, so some days we'll have a big, huge procedure, like anesthetize a lion and find out all about his intestinal tract. Um, other days I'll walk around the zoo and visit a poison dart frog that has a tear in his skin and visit a lizard who has a sore toe and visit a blue tail skink that has arthritis in her forearms. Uh, you know, it's really varied. So we can make house calls all around campus or really focus on um, a big procedure that takes a lot of us, all keepers and hospital staff, which consists of nurses, veterinarians, and then we have hospital specific keepers as well. Uh, so the days are very, uh, lots of different things happen. <laughs> Well, I love it. Um, so let's start talking about problems. Um, this is a conservation-based little podcast show. 
Um, so we really have to look at some of the issues in California, the animals that are affected. We're going to have our cocktail and then talk about solutions. So here's my first question for you. Um, here is a bird. Who who lives in Oakland recognizes this bird species? While you're thinking about it, Dr. Herman, why don't you tell us, like, who, what is this bird and why is it something that we have paid attention to before? So this is a black crowned night heron juvenile. The adults have a white body and a black head. They really, really look different. Um, and unfortunately they decided downtown Oakland down by the post office was a great roosting place for their babies. Um, there's a lot of disruption there. It's very dense urban environment. So a really good example, I think of, you know, human wildlife interface and conflict. You know, you think of that happening internationally, but it happens in our own backyard all over California, this happens. Um, so the baby birds actually would fall out of the trees and then the parents couldn't do anything to help them. Um, right. So good problem. Problem number one. Um, ooh, Linda, Linda got it. <laughs> all right, here's another little trivia for people. Dr. Herman tells me everyone loves a good x-ray. This x-ray shows are big problems. Um, anybody know what this x-ray is? What the little fragment is in there? Hmm. Dr. Herman, what's going on here? Uh, that is a piece of lead um, inside uh, the ventriculus of a condor. Uh, so another thing that we do, you know, here at the Oakland Zoo, we really take care of all our resident animals, but we also do a lot of wildlife rescue, recovery, conservation work. Uh, so we are on the California Condor Recovery Team. Mm -hmm. So we treat condors that are found at Pinnacles National Park and by Ventana Wildlife Society. That's kind of a shared flock that goes across yeah. the mountains down in Big Sur. Um, and we treat them for lead toxicity. So the first thing we do when they walk in the door, um, you know, the biologists have found out in the field that they have high lead levels is we x-ray them to see if there's a lead fragment that we have to ensure passes. Um, so it's not a continued source of the poison in their body. All right. So this is from lead bullets that people, are they shooting an animal and the condors, the vulture who eats that animal? Yeah, they're kind of an alpha carrion bird. So uh, say you're shooting varmints on your property um, or uh, other, you know, deer, feral pigs, that kind of thing, uh, that animal may go die. Um, they do prefer food that has been passed away for four to five days, um, has the best bouquet, I think. <laughs> and then the condor comes in and, you know, say the shotgun really blasted into their side, they'll come up and, you know, eat right there and so get a, a really high dose. Um, of lead into their body. Mm -hmm. And then systemically, the first thing it does really is it stops their intestinal tract. Uh, so they can't eat, they can't digest food. They can come in with a really distended crop that's just filled with rotten food and, and so sick. It's a huge reason for mortality in this conservation project. Okay. All right. We have two more cases. A lot of you will be familiar with this case. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Herman, what's going on in this picture with this species? Well, that is Mr. Captain Cal, uh, named after a firefighting mascot. Um, he was found uh, in the Zog Fire in Northern California this summer. I would like to note, I think in this picture, you can see a good Samaritan did put their pastrami and cheese sandwich in there with him. <laughs> I think to help him out a little yeah. bit for the trip to the Oakland Zoo. Cal was tiny. Uh, I think he weighed less than three pounds when we first got him uh, with severe, severe burns, um, all the tissue falling off, really infected, really dirty on all four feet, uh, whiskers burned off, very dehydrated and starving. So that's the little guy is what he looked like when he first walked in the door. Okay. Um, but there's problems with the cubs or the kittens um, due to loss of a mom, wildfire, but sometimes there's just an issue with an adult as well. What could have happened to an adult? Well, usually when we see um, adult lions having problems, it's being hit by a car. Mm -hmm. So, um, and then for the juveniles, it's just 
they live with their mom for two years. They really have an intense relationship with their parent, learning how to hunt and live. So if they're less than two years old and their mom gets hit by a car, they're an orphan that needs support. Um, yeah. So often they'll come in starving. You know, they just can't get food. Um, all right. Well, we've got one more animal, um, and this one is really exciting and different, and um, I'm excited to learn more about it. What? That bunny looks perfectly healthy. What's going on there? That's a riparian brush rabbit. They're so cute. You can't really tell the, from the picture. We should put like a toothbrush next to her or something, but they really tiny. look this big. We <laughs> called them the hobbit rabbit. Um, they're tiny. They're very ferocious, though. Um, and so that's a riparian brush rabbit, which is an endangered rabbit that lives on 1% of its original range out in the Stanislaus um, uh, River area. And what we have here in California is rabbit hemorrhagic disease virus um, that's rapidly spreading through the country. Um, it's a, a introduced virus, uh, but basically what everybody is worried about California Fish and Wildlife Service is this virus hitting this tiny endangered population of this special species of rabbits and just wiping them out. Um, okay, so thanks for running through those issues. We, we like to really build up, you know, the tension um, and then we leave ourselves with a lovely refreshing drink. So we're gonna do that right now. Um, unless there's an audience question right now that I can just share, while you're thinking if you have a question, I'm gonna talk a little bit about our lovely restaurant that helped us out this time. It's called District in Oakland. It's actually in old Oakland. It's super charming, outdoor seating right now. I think 25% indoor because they just made the switch. Um, and they've got pizza, wine, whiskey, um, just a really lovely place. And they made an amazing video, so I'm very excited to share that with you. So if there's a question afterwards, I'll take it, but we're gonna hide ourselves and learn all about this lovely drink. Hello. And welcome to the 2021 kickoff of Conservation and Cocktails for the Oakland Zoo. My name is John Marsh. I'm the general manager of District in downtown Oakland. Thank you so much for having me here tonight. Growing up in Oakland, the zoo has always been a very special place for myself and my family. Here in downtown Oakland, our city bird, the black crowned night heron, has lost a lot of its habitat due to overdevelopment these birds oftentimes look for nests in places that are not ideal for them. This leads to overcrowding and tree branches that will fall and their chicks will fall from the trees and be injured. The Oakland Zoo Recovery Program will rehabilitate these animals and release them into places that are more suited for their habitat. Today I've created a cocktail inspired by the black crowned night heron. So I'd like to invite you inside a district and come make a cocktail with me. Welcome inside of District Oakland. Tonight we'll be making a classic 1920s cocktail called a Boulevardier. Boulevardier loosely translates in French to a man about town. Our cocktail inspired by the black crown night heron will be called the bird about town. This will be featuring Wright and Brown's bourbon it's Oakland's first distillery since Prohibition. Their bourbon contains corn, rye, and barley in the mash. The corn brings a sweetness, the rye a dry spice, and the barley a rich mouthful feel. So let's get going. Before I came up with the drink, I came up with the name of the drink. Um, I just thought about the black crowned night heron and it being all over town, all over Oakland. And I thought of a drink called the Boulevardier, which was called the man about town. And I thought about this bird about town and it just hit me. So I went with that recipe and that idea and came up with this cocktail, which I think is a great, elegant, beautiful drink that really represents the bird and our city. Why is it 
important for me specifically to support this event. I think that the work that they do is admirable. I think that they need as much help as they can get. It's been a very tough year for everyone and helping them out with their noble cause is something that we all need to be a part of and get behind. And there we have Oakland City Bird has its own cocktail, the Bird About Town. So raise your glasses in a toast. Cheers to you and all the conservation that work that you do. We thank you. Oh, I'm sorry, I have to show this. Oh, I guess you can't see it now. There was credits. So that, that was amazing. That's like the Oscars of drink videos. Um, is it awards eligible? We're gonna have to give that one an award. That was pretty outstanding. Well, welcome back everybody. Um, we are gonna do a little toast to you, Dr. Herman. Here's our toast. <laughs> Here we go. To taking action for wildlife, to Dr. Herman, a big hug. Let's do this together. Now, whether you have a virgin one or an alcohol one, chug a lug. That's not like a specimen container or anything, is it? No, it's quite clean. It's from the kitchen. Okay. Very it's not good. from the lab. <laughs> so that's delicious. Thank you, District. You're incredible. Um, and we did have some questions and I feel like some of the questions are going to get answered as we talk. So I've got an eye on your questions, everybody, but let's go to our favorite thing and that's solutions. So starting with that funny looking, amazing bird, um, the one that our drink is named after. So what has the Oakland Zoo done before for this bird? Well, um, it's pretty neat because folks from all over would bring the zoo, the birds to us at the hospital. Mm -hmm. um, so we don't have a huge, huge staff here at the hospital. So we would hear about a bird and one of the keepers would go pick up the bird, you know, because really good Samaritans would just find the birds on the ground, um, sometimes injured, sometimes just fallen out of the nest so they can't be repatriated to their parents. So, but folks from accounting would go pick up a bird and volunteers and docents and good Samaritans would just bring them to the zoo. And then most of them were dehydrated. So we would always rehydrate them. If they had injuries, we would treat them. Um, and then once they were deemed stable, they would be transported by the cool group of Good Samaritans, either from accounting or the public or a keeper or someone from the vet hospital. Um, and then they go to the International Bird Rescue and um, get rehabilitated for release. So most of them did really well. Um, every now and then we would have one so gravely injured that we'd have to put them to sleep. But usually um, they very smoothly were rehabilitated and releasable and everything. So it's great. Okay, um, here's more of that project. What's going on here? Also, oh, this x-ray here is of one of the juveniles with a broken leg. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a pretty grave injury um, and very hard to heal from. Mm -hmm. Okay. But um, the other guy in the picture is very feisty and very happy. We do <laughs> always have to wear sunglasses when they work on us uh, or when we work on them because they want to peck us in the eye. Got it. So, and Dr. Herman, it's not like you plan that day you're going to get a, a bird. Like these kind of cases, is it a call? Is it you just never know? You could be in the middle of your full day. Yeah, that's usually how it happens. Um, you know, I will say the team here is, you know, really joyful in our work. Like we really love the work that we do. And we have so much support from the rest of the zoo um, that when we get a call like that, we just figure it out. And no matter what else is going on, you know, we just kind of say, come on in, we got it. So it's the right thing to do. So that's what we do. I love it. Um, someone here is looking for that recipe again. And we have Allison with a nice question. How do you rehydrate a bird? 
Oh, it depends. So you can do oral rehydration. Um, mm -hmm. Usually you need to put fluid, um, it can have electrolytes in it, it can have sugar in it, it can have, you know, really almost like a bird milkshake. And we have all different concoctions for like fish eating birds or um, fruit eating birds, that kind of thing. Um, but you can put it into their crop, which is a big pocket where they hold their food uh, with a tube. We just gently slide it in, they're awake, they tolerate it really well. Um, so that's one way. Um, and then another way when they're more sick is, or if they're eating well and we just really need to hydrate them is we can do injectable fluids. So we use lactated ringers to, um, solution also often, which is what, you know, if we were dehydrated and went to the hospital, that would, is what we would be given as well. Okay. Something I have to say as the conservation VP that I love about that project is you worked with IBR, but you were all, Oakland Zoo was also collaborating with Golden Gate Audubon, and there wow. were just a lot of different organizations and people who came together to do this. And I love that Oakland Zoo is part of alliances and systems um, locally. I think that's a common theme here. Like it really takes a lot of people from mm -hmm. finding Captain Cal in the field to getting him down here to all the intensive care. Mm -hmm. um, you think about too, the really highly intelligent animals, we need, the high level training and emotional understanding that our keeper staff provides here, yeah. um, in addition to our ability to treat infection and do anesthesia and everything like that. Like Captain Cal and the girls, you know, we didn't just save their bodies, we kind of saved their psyches as well and mm -hmm. made them realize that humans weren't going to hurt them and they could live in captivity with a relaxed and happy way. And we're really seeing that in their new home, that they're just thriving and so well addressed, adjusted and really well bonded. Um, so all of this stuff is a ton of teamwork. That's for sure. Yeah. So teams everywhere. All right. Well, we're going to get to those mountain lions. And I love that there's a Patricia here from Columbus Zoo with a little update, but we're going to show Aww. that today. I love it. Um, but speaking of birds, here's a here's an amazing endangered bird that I'm so proud that you guys do work for. And I love this image because look at that face. Um, so this is the California condor that has the issue with the lead poisoning. Like, how do you even begin this kind of work? Uh, so we usually get a call from either Ventana Wildlife Society or Pinnacles National Park Rangers. Um, you know, they have a huge condor program and flock there. So they have them come into flight cages. They do field testing for lead. And if their lead is high, then they'll bring them up here for us to do chelation treatment, which is Latin for claw. So that's a molecular claw that we inject into their body um, that pulls the lead out of their bloodstream, as well as trying to get if they have a fragment to pass. So here's some of the nurses. Um, the condor is wide awake um, and they're quite big, um, but he's in something called an ABBA, which is a little cape uh, that we kind of slide them into and snug them into and then tie them up and they just kind of lay there a little mad. Um, and then we can quickly and safely do x-rays without risking a wing or having to do anesthesia or anything like that. So it's a very condor specific way to get the information that we need to see if they have a fragment that we need to get out of their body in addition to chelating, um, pulling the lead out of their bloodstream. Okay. So is that what's happening? Is this the procedure? Yep. So that's one of the hospital keepers, um, Adam Zuby, holding the bird. Um, I think I'm listening with my stethoscope. Uh, we always do a complete health check on them every time we handle them and treat them. Um, just so we're getting all the information that we can. When they come in, not only do we do x-rays, um, but we treat if they have any skin parasites. We take blood work to check their red and white blood cell count, their kidney function, their liver function, their electrolytes. Um, just make sure there's nothing else that we need to address why we have them here in a temporary captive situation. So yep, the keepers hold them just like that. Um, that's again a team effort. It takes a lot of us to clean and feed and handle. Um, and we do try to handle them and treat them in a way that they'll thrive as a released wild animal again. Um, so there's a lot of kind of specific techniques that we use with them. Um, but while they're here, every time we give a chelation injection, we do um, give them fluids to really hydrate them as well. Got it. So um, once you get them, you do the work, how how long are you keeping them? And what 
my question was like, how do you take care of them, but also keep them wild for release? So we never feed them. Um, we feed them through a little box shoot in the wall so they don't associate us with food and then be released into the wild and land on someone's picnic. Um, so, um, and then we do things when we handle them so that when they do get handled by us, um, they almost participate in it. They're really highly intelligent, kind of magical, intense birds. Um, so we do very particular um, handling that we learned from the folks down at LA Zoo who really were on the ground floor for when the condors were first pulled out of the wild in the 80s to save the species. Um, so we handle them in a way that keeps them wild, um, but also doesn't have a lot of aversive events um, associated with the treatment that they need. You know, we have birds that have come through here that we've treated for the same bird, treated for lead poisoning up to four times, you know, over the years. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, we clear the lead and then they go back out and there's more exposure in the environment and they come back in, but it's a way to save them. And often they're breeding and living these wild lives in between. So it is a very successful program. You know, we had, nine condors in the mid 80s and now we have 450 so spread throughout the western u.s so it's definitely a program that's successful but intensive yeah and then just like with the herons you're working with golden gate audubon and ibr like who are your who are the allies here oh gosh there's so many mm -hmm. um you know, Ventana Wildlife Society, uh, Pinnacles National Park, Santa Barbara Zoo, LA Zoo, San Diego Zoo. Um, there's a group in Mexico that's um, working on the Baja condors. There's a small population there. Um, Peregrine, um, they're doing a lot of captive breeding in Idaho and then also um, working on the flock in the Grand Canyon. So, um, I think this is a recurring theme tonight. It takes a yeah, lot yeah. of people to do this work. So, uh, but it's a huge group of people that work mm -hmm. really hard. We have an annual meeting where we go learn about condor studies and techniques and successes mm -hmm. and things that didn't go well. And um, it's a really dedicated group of people. I mean, they're amazing. They're a living dinosaur and they're so intelligent. Uh, you know, they're, I guess, it's really intense, really magical. They feel like they're coming from another time on our planet. Wow, that's amazing. Um, okay, well, I, these are amazing. We're really looking out for birds. Let's check out some mammals. And we're not going to cubs quite yet, people. Um, but I do want to talk about mountain lions because um, I've been really proud of what we've done for some of the adult mountain lions. Um, so what is happening here? And it looks like all kinds of people are here in this picture. Yeah, so this is a young guy. Um, we called him Mr. San Francisco because um, he's kind of on the lam in San Francisco down by AT&T mm -hmm. Park, which is just not a good place for a mountain lion. Uh, he's, he was young, probably about a year and a half, maybe even somewhere between a year and a uh, year and a half. Um, and so some valiant animal care workers working with SFPD actually caught him in a net. He weighed 75 pounds. So that was amazing that they could do that. And they brought him to us and he actually was um, young and without his mom, but also pretty healthy. So uh, we took blood samples. Uh, Santa Cruz Mountain Lion Research Group from the university came up and actually were able to put a radio collar on him. Uh, we vaccinated him. Um, so it was great. Um, we got a lot of information from him and we were able to help him as well. Okay. Amazing. This was the one who, I mean, was sighted all over the area and... Oh yeah. Like everybody's ring doorbells were taking pictures of him. Yeah. <laughs> it was definitely wildlife human interface <laughs> big time mm -hmm. and what kind of like what kind of relationship does oakland zoo have with the california department of fish and wildlife that they call us or they come to us like how does that oh, work amazing you know they're so great and they're doing such wonderful things in our state um, and they need help. And we have this big, beautiful hospital. We have such a highly skilled 
um, set of folks, mm -hmm. uh, both in the husbandry department, the keepers for you know training and helping us take care of the animals while they're here, but also the veterinary work uh, nurses that work here. You know, we can anesthetize a tiger, we can anesthetize uh, an African lion. Of course, we can anesthetize and care for a mountain lion from our mm -hmm. own state. So there's a really uh, specialized set of skills, a big beautiful facility. You know, it's the right thing for us to do this work, and it's you know, I don't know, I feel like they're all a poignant face of these big issues happening in the state of California. Uh, so yeah, you know, we get the phone call and they come on over. So that phone call, it's not like you get it nine to five while you're in your office, like when that phone call can happen anytime, right? Yeah, um, but we love the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. Um, they do so much good, important work. And, you know, we were so honored to be able to do all the work on the riparian brush rabbits and, you know, caring for these mountain lions. They're just, I feel like I'm wearing, using the word magical a lot, but they're demigods, you know, they're just these beings that are so intelligent and have a set of skills that we can't even touch, you know, and how they move through the world. It's it's really great to be able to help them. That's amazing. All right, I am going to sh share a couple of opportunities for people to ask a question right now. So here's one from Barbara. Um, do you do your labs um, on site or send it out? Oh, that's a good question. We do both, actually. Um, we have an in-house laboratory where we do a lot of work. Um, and boy, do we send out to a lot of special places, you know, like we'll send an amphibian fecal where we need to really find out what type of amoeba it is to University of Florida. Texas A&M does special GI panels. That's what we sent um, in for the lion. Uh, we sent viral testing from the lion to Cornell because they have a special lab. So we use a lot of different labs. Um, we do a lot of stuff in-house and then we also use um, the big commercial lab Antec for a lot of our work, just like uh, a small animal clinic would. Got, okay. Um, a couple questions, maybe you know the answer to this. Um, Quinn says, can you provide info on the story of our the two condors living at the zoo? How did they come to be there? Oh, um, one was from uh, Oregon Zoo in Portland, and I am right now forgetting where the other one was from. Oh, well, somebody in the chat will definitely answer that question, by Thank the way. You. Please. <laughs> I have your questions, and I'm going to try to pull some into the conversation, but we're going to go back. We're going to have Dr. Herman go back, other people from the zoo, and even after this runs, you can check Facebook, and we'll have your question answered. So hang on Thank you. questions. It is a good question. I will answer one thing about that and that I got to be there when we had some local native community got to do like a naming ceremony of those two condors. So they were incredibly important to, you know, so many different people, but it was an honor to be part of, of, of their story and their history. Um, all right, here we go, Dr. Herman. Let's hear this story. Well, that is Mr. Cal when he first showed up. Um, very small, very weak, very burned. Um, it took us three anesthetic events to even get his feet clean, um, to get all the dirt and dead tissue off of um, with really severe third degree burns like that. Um, you actually have to remove all the dead and dying tissue because it's a real, um, place where bacteria can get into the wound and cause a fatal sepsis. Um, so, you know, he came in and giving him fluids, lots and lots of pain medication, um, antibiotics. Uh, he was a great eater. He didn't eat the sandwich, um, but he really ate well from the minute he walked in the door. And that always gave me hope. Um, about five days after he did come in, um, he did almost die. Um, his white blood cell count shot up. His proteins really went low. He had a lot of electrolyte problems. Um, and despite all our efforts, a very severe infection developed on all his feet, which, you know, wasn't a surprise. They were completely burned and crusted with dirt and other debris. Um, 
and we just worked really hard. <laughs> so it was the veterinary team doing anesthesia on him every day. Um, the keeper team, you know, up at California Trail, they know a lot about captive mountain lions and how to socialize them and feed them and care for them. Um, so the keepers came off the California Trail to really help us. Uh, so that was great. And then the nurses and other doctors here, we would perform anesthesia, um, removed all the tissue. Once we got all the dead tissue off of him, then we had to try to heal his feet. So we did work with a veterinary burn specialist, Dr. Jamie Payton from UC Davis, wow. um, and really putting honey bandages on his feet. We started out with raw local Manuka honey uh, and then graduated to a formal honey bandage. But honey is a potent antibacterial. It sounds super medieval and there's so much science behind it. It's really, really cool. Um, so we did honey bandages with him and he just turned a corner and rocketed up. You know, I remember one day changing his bandages and I was like, I think that's new tissue coming back. You wow. Know, hamburger at first. Wow. Um, and so painful. You know, we had to do everything under general anesthesia. Um, so basically, you know, one day there was a little dot of new healthy granulation tissue. And then the next day there was five and, you know, just crept in from the sides. And every day you could see his body was just fixing itself. So uh, that was great. So. Was great. I had to show the before and after because it was kind of amazing. That's him, right? Those are some very beautiful feet. Yes, that is Captain, his beautiful style. And um, he was pretty ginger when the bandages first came off. That's for sure. But he got over it pretty quickly. Wow. So amazing and impressive. And I love that your vet center was willing to share this whole story with so many people. And um while I pop up the next picture, my question for you is, why do you think everyone was so moved by Captain Cal's story? It feels like it really struck a chord with so many people around the world. Was it the- I think because he is such a poignant face mm -hmm. of this huge, huge environmental catastrophe that's going on. You know, he was a little beautiful person, so mm -hmm. injured by climate change induced wildfire, which is, a terrible thing that, you know, we all need to mobilize to help and reverse this trend. So I think he was a way to wrap your compassion around a topic that's, you know, hard to digest and, um, you know, a huge deal right now. Yeah. So I, I think, I think also he's so beautiful um, and so tiny, you know, he was so young when this happened to him. Mm -hmm. uh, so I would say those things. poignant face on an environmental tragedy. Yeah. All right, so here's a couple more cubs. So these kittens were a different story, different background, but came in around the same time miraculously, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, which was great. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they had some mild parasites and were a little dehydrated and a little skinny, but uh, Goldie and Poppy, that's what Columbus Zoo named them, which I love. Those really good names. Uh, they were pretty robust from minute one, pretty sassy. Um, so Captain, you know, he had those big bandaged, huge feet. As soon as we could get him out of his intensive care cage, um, we have a, a big bank of enclosures here at the hospital. Uh, we have one with a little swimming pool in it in case we get an alligator for one of our own whistling ducks or something like that. Um, but we have really nice ways that we can let them either see each other or share an area. They have indoor, outdoor access so they can get fresh air and sunshine. Um, so basically we just did side by side where we um, the keepers put in a big see-through piece of fencing so the kids could kind of look at each other through the fence, um, but Captain Cal wouldn't be so rough and tumble that he would injure his healing feet, which were still bandaged. Um, but we did intro them when he still had his bandages on. Um, we just felt for his social emotional growth that he needed that. Um, and it was just crazy. You know, they just stared at each other for a little while and then just wrestled for days. Um, and so playful and so fun and so bonded. And we're just really happy that they can continue their lives together. All right. On the zoo. Good time to show Patricia's comment who says, 
Jackie, I'm a docent at Columbia Zoo, answering Jackie. Captain Cal's new home, he and the girls are doing great. They share space with an adult cougar. Everyone's getting along. And that's really due to the teamwork that the animal care team put together so they'd know how to get along. Yeah, I felt like we kind of saved his body and kind of saved his mind as well. Um, he was really fearful um, after we had worked on him for a week or two. You think about it, he can't intellectualize anything that we're doing. And every day we're, you know, changing bandages and he's in so much pain. And, um, you know, we gave him narcotics and anti-inflammatories and topical pain medication. We got a special like ketamine paste from UC Davis to put on his feet. And still, you know, human burn patients say they want to go crazy from the pain. You know, it's a lot and he can't intellectualize any of it. Um, so it's just really nice that we could, you know, integrate a lot of positive stuff so early. Um, and then just having some friends, like these babies should not be by themselves. Mm. They really, um, they're very social and they have big social needs. So it was serendipity that the girls showed up. Um, and the girls were likely, or they were orphaned by their mom. Um, and and you can't grow these mountain lions to be a couple, we a month old and release them, can you? No, if they're separated from their parent, um, I know I've talked with um, Dr. Deanna Clifford, um, the head of California Fish and Wildlife, who really knows a lot about mountain lions in the wild and their behavior. And um, really, if they're under a year and a half, mm -hmm. under a year, um, like there, it's a little dicey, um, but some of them can really do well, but definitely these little kittens will unfortunately never be releasable to the wild. Certainly at some point we would love to work on some project where we can find out more about rewilding these animals. Um, but right now the little babies, we save their life. Um, and then they do, you know, become captive animals. Uh, that are really ambassadors for the species. You know, this is our lion. This is our North American tiger. Mm -hmm. um, and you still can get a, a depredation permanent to get rid of them. So I think, you know, the guys that come in out of the wild and have to stay captive, they're making people realize how beautiful they are and just how fascinating and huge. And like, these are from our state. You know, you can have one in your town. Like, it's amazing. We need to protect them. So um, even though their life in the wild is over, um, places like the Columbus Zoo have massive, beautiful exhibits up on California Trail where our um, three mountain lions who were all orphan babies uh, live. It's very naturalistic with a lot of space and a lot of stuff to do so they can have a lot of natural behaviors. Well, thank you for that. There's a few more mountain lion questions there, but we're gonna move on to that rabbit because I wanna see what the Oakland Zoo does for a species that potentially could go extinct. So here we are. Um, looks like we're out there in the wild. What's going on? So, um, that is one of our Oakland Zoo heroes, um, Darren and Dr. Deanna Clifford. Um, we have to handle them in the pillowcase so that they're, again, remember everybody, they're like this big. Um, but a rabbit has a very light skeleton and a very heavy musculature. Um, so if they're scared and kick really hard, they can break their back. Um, so these are spooky little wild animals, you know, that don't want anything to do with us. So we handle them inside a pillowcase so we can keep their spine in the C curve and really protect it. Mm -hmm. um, and I was happy to say uh, we didn't have any spinal injuries in this whole project, um, but we were meticulous about how we handled them. All right, and then you handle them, you bring them in, and then what happens? Oh. So captured in the wild, uh, brought here. Um, we did a total, I believe, of 84 anesthesias on these guys within two months to one, do physical health. The biologists in the field would put a little ear tag on so we could identify everybody, but we would figure out what sex they were. We would ultrasound them to see if they were pregnant because if they were pregnant, hands off, back out to the wild, go make some endangered babies. Um, and then we would do blood work to make sure they were healthy. Um, treat them for any kind of parasites or other injuries that they might have. And then um, 
once they were kind of settled here, uh, we took a small part of the cohort and vaccinated them with the imported rabbit hemorrhagic disease uh, virus vaccine, um, and then monitored them very carefully. Did they go off food? Was there any bad reaction to the vaccine? Because really, this is not a situation where you had 10 years to see if they lived to a fine ancient old age if they got this vaccine. This is a crisis, you know, the virus is in Kern County and rapidly spreading northwards. Um, and this is really kind of a Noah's Ark project. So um, the biologists would catch the bunny rabbits. Um, and actually a lot of our team keepers and veterinary nurses went out there into the field, into the brush uh, to catch the rabbits, um, bring them here. And then we had a cohort of 20. So once we decided the vaccine wasn't gonna hurt them, we vaccinated the whole group, but then to get data so we could know does this vaccine work? Um, we did three additional procedures where we checked their antibody levels after vaccines and also boosted the vaccine because we just didn't know would one vaccine work. Um, and all the rabbits did really, really well. They were all released. Um, and then the we had enough data from this huge effort that we all did, you know, the fish and wildlife vets would come in and help us and we'd have two tables going and anesthetizing two bunnies at the same time. Um, so it was very cool. And then they all did great and were released. And then we had the confidence to really rapidly vaccinate the group in the field, um, which is going really well. That's amazing. And so far we haven't found a single riparian brush rabbit that's died from hemorrhagic disease. So um you know they're kind of quiet unassuming neat little subtle animals uh but i don't know maybe we help save the species we'll find out <laughs> so um as someone who's been at the zoo a long time um uh, i know we've always had an open mind about this we've you know been on the pipeline of helping but since you've been there um i feel like you've really just inspired all the staff you've mentioned to be even more excited to do this. And, and the program even has a name like Oakland Zoo Wildlife Rescue and Recovery. Um, why did the Oakland Zoo decide to really um, go so passionately in this direction? I think this seems like the right thing. Mm -hmm. um, we're activists, um, we're wildlife activists. You know, we have many rescue animals here at the zoo. We have wildlife partners, not just in the state of California, but in Uganda and Kenya and Borneo. Um, so the conservation work that we can do for local animals, I think really reflects the ethos of the Oakland Zoo. You know, we're about saving wild animals and wild places. and yes, we want people to have an enjoyable experience here, but we have an important message too. Um, and I feel like the staff here, the veterinary nurses, the other veterinarians, the keepers, everybody at the zoo, whatever position they're working in, we need to do the right thing. Um, and it's a moment in time, I think we're doing the right thing. Um, it's, it's one of those moments in time where doing the right thing is very important. Um, so I think people feel that their work is um, meaningful and that we can offer a lot of change for the positive. And I think helping these wild animals, in addition to taking really good care of our resident animals, uh, it's just the right thing. I love it. Um, all right, I have two questions in our two minutes. Um, one is, you have one minute to answer this one. Like, what is your vision moving forward? Oh boy, I don't know if I can answer that in a minute. Um, so we're bringing in UC Davis students to train them with the work that we do. Got to grow the next generation. Uh, and we're really expanding our capacity, you know, working on our efficiency. Uh, we are a nonprofit, so always trying to be efficient with the funds that we have. How can we provide the most care at the high level that we expect? How can we educate the next generation? Um, so taking in more wildlife, doing more international field work, uh, training veterinary nurses and veterinarians uh, that wanna do this work, it's definitely a specialized part of veterinary practice. 
I love it. Okay, so here's a chance before we part, maybe we have 30 seconds, just for everybody listening and the fact that this will be recorded and maybe someone else will listen two months from now. Um, what can the app, what can we all do to like prevent some of these issues from happening? Like what are a couple of good ones that we should just be aware of? Well, I think if they want to vote for an over uh, over freeway overpass in your area, vote for it. Mm -hmm. Those things are expensive. There's often a parcel tax. And it's amazing how many animals can be saved just being able to get over the freeway safely. Um, I think don't use lead shot. Use copper uh, when you're hunting. Uh, it's pretty innocuous and isn't going to kill our condors. Mm -hmm. And... You know, don't buy stuff that's made from illegal wildlife. Just pay attention. You know, this stuff matters. All right. I love it. Um, I love it. Zoo has a whole living with wildlife resource. So check out the website. There's also maybe you can be popped over into the chat. Um, well, we want to do, you know, it's already seven. Let's just do everyone. We'll feel it together. A big thank you. My I pleasure. Thank you for everything you're doing and your leadership. And thank you to this community who, who hung out with us for the hour. And um, keep on doing it, Dr. Herman. Thank you, everybody. I really appreciate it. I appreciate your time. Big toast. <laughs>